It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Welcome back to The Green Rush, the business of cannabis. We're going to be talking about everything that is magic mushrooms today. With me to help me do that, Dr. Michelle Ross. She's the founder of Infuse Health and Shango Loss, the founder and host of Shaping Fire. Thanks, y'all, for being with me on this Friday afternoon. How are you? Good. Very Thanks good. for the invitation. Yeah, anytime. Um, so jumping right in, um, Shango, this one's for you. And then Dr. Michelle Ross will we'll give her two cents after that. I want to jump in with uh, something fun. Celebrities. Celebrity cannabis mm. hasn't done well at all. Let's talk about uh, celebrities in the psychedelic industry, including actors like uh, Megan Fox, Will Smith, Jada Pinkett Smith, and talk show host Chesley, um, Chelsea Handler. They've all testified to the psychedelically transformative powers of a psychedelic trip. Will those profiting maintain the counterculture ideals of the people who popularized it? Oh, wow. That, uh, yeah, it is starting out the big. Well, first of all, I, I'll say right off the top, I'm not a big fan of celebrity involvement uh, with health at all. Um, and I haven't liked what I've seen from celebrities starting uh, cannabis uh, companies. They don't necessarily seem to have the same values of the culture originally. And uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I suspect that that same thing could happen uh, with mushrooms as well, where suddenly the celebrity becomes more important with the application of the medicine. That said, um, there are are definitely certain parts of the American public that you can only reach with those kind of folks. And uh, to, so for many people um, hearing a, you know, somebody with long hair or, or a beard talk about uh, psychedelics, they may put it like simply in a hippie category. But if you, they see an NFL player when they're watching the games every weekend, talk about their concussions and how using microdosing uh, eases the impacts uh, no pun intended, uh, of their of their um, injuries, um, suddenly their ears are open. So I, I think that it is very important um, where we rely on them, um, not necessarily for building the brand for the companies, uh, but more for focused outreach. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ross, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I have to agree a lot with what Shango already has said. Um, but, you know, I think when we have these celebrities that are saying things like psychedelics have made such a big impact in their life. And then of course we see them do blunders <laughs> in public, such as Will Smith punching, you know, Chris Rock. And of course saying he had done all these ayahuasca trips and worked on his ego and then did something as silly as, as that on TV. Um, that's not helping um, the psychedelic industry. That's not helping build any brands. No one can say, Hey, you know, after that, let's, you know, advertise an ayahuasca retreat or, you know, uh, use, use any of that, right? Um, so I think that um, we really should let, let celebrities say their stories, but let's not build, um, you know, uh, on the backs of celebrities. Uh, I really think that we should build on the science um, and, and again, keep the celebrities out of it. We haven't really seen a lot of, of, a lot of success with celebrity brands and cannabis. And I don't think what we're going to see a lot of success with celebrity brands uh, in psychedelics, with the exception, again, of very, very passionate uh, people. Like, again, uh, you had, I think, um, Riley Cope on, on uh, your show a little earlier. Uh, he is somebody who I really, really do respect, who uh, has had uh, a very significant experience um, with psychedelics and a traumatic brain injury, very different. Um, but, it, you know, he is both an entrepreneur and somebody in the space, not just somebody who, you know, ran off with a shaman and then, you know, did a hundred interviews or something like that. So I think it's really important that we separate the sensationalism, the, the PR buzz uh, versus somebody who is actually building real businesses in this space. My understanding is, is there's not the focus on um, addiction. You have researchers at the New York University, John Hopkins, they're creating research and training programs to focus on that therapeutic use uh, and just um, more, more attention on mental health. Um, I personally don't think it's an attention on mental health. I think it's an attention on the money that uh, is backed by mental health. That's just 
I don't think the government cares about your health or mine. That's just me personally. Um, but so we have to take that into our own hands, uh, our health into our own hands. Um, what are the benefits, Shango, uh, and risks for using mushrooms? Well, I mean, that could be an entire show in and of itself, yeah. right? But 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 to <laughs> but to quickly summarize, um, uh, what we're seeing mostly from people uh, using mushrooms for health reasons would be number one, by far the most common is by microdosing, um, small amounts of of um, uh, the psilocin in the brain um, is a neuro causes neurogenesis, and so you're rebuilding neural pathways and creating new brain cells for the, the um, you know so that uh, do slow mental degradation. Um, also, it helps with a lot of other uh, issues like um, uh, uh, anxiety, depression, concerns with end of life, um, uh, you know, existential dread. Uh, there's there's lots of things that microdosing can help with. Now, there's also a whole slew of studies showing that microdosing can help uh, rewire the central nervous system. But but honestly, this isn't getting the same amount of a, of attention yet. And you know, to a certain degree, that's the media's fault. And to a certain degree, people are not yet aware of these options and so they're not being uh, facilitated up and you know we have to remember it's still a schedule one even though availability has spiked um it is still you know you still can get in trouble for holding on to it um and then of course there are the people who are are taking um you know uh, 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 uh what we call museum doses that you know like maybe a gram and that's just mostly for often for quality of life to to increase uh your the quality of the day of the beach or the or the time with your family or maybe love or whatever right it's just like a quality of life increase and then you get people who are taking uh large doses or heroic doses um because there is something that is disjointed that they want to smooth out they want to go through some sort of ego death or commune with the all or speak to god um all of these are different uh life enhancing ways that people are using mushrooms um that are we're just coming to the point of of comfort to even be talking about as far as the dangers the the primary uh, danger is 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 taking too much under the wrong set and setting and yourself having an experience that is negative either through paranoia or fear or you go and you do something stupid like you know call paramedics or you know uh you know decide you're going to take off your clothes and, and run downtown you know i mean like, like these are the we're not it's not the kind of um danger where if you take too many you are likely to die or or it's addictive or anything like that it's mostly um uh you having a misunderstanding of the world around you and then doing something that ends up on Instagram. <laughs> um, I want to add, um, I'm actually an addiction neuroscientist. Uh, and some of the research out there actually shows that uh, taking more than microdoses of psilocybin mushrooms is very effective at reducing consumption of cigarettes. And so, you know, uh, about 50% less uh, cigarette smoke, actually, uh, when you hmm. use. This, these are older studies, too. It's very interesting. It's like there's a lot of newer research, you know, on microdosing. But there's other studies out there that, you know, really did show that the, this was effective for reducing a lot of different addictive activities. And so, you know, when you look at public health, right, one of the biggest public health issues is, is nicotine and smoking. And so if we could get people to stop smoking, that would be a huge thing. So we really should be rolling out uh, psilocybin. And it's interesting because the uh, people that we, uh, you know, first talked to um, informing decriminalized Denver and some of the other decriminalized nature groups across the country, a lot of the motivation for or these people forming these groups was, hey, I use psilocybin mushrooms to quit smoking. So this was something that mm. is we see in studies, but this is something that we also see anecdotally over and over and over again. So uh, when I see somebody that is actually struggling with quitting tobacco, that's one of the first things that I try uh, to recommend, you know, try microdosing. If microdosing doesn't work, try a bigger dose, you know, try to work with someone. And, you know, a lot of times it's actually very, very successful. So that's my two cents there. What causes a bad trip? My brother-in-law took mushrooms and he, um, he just had this really bad trip where he got down on himself and felt like he was a POS and just a terrible individual and had all these like really negative thoughts. And it just really brought him down and, and it was a bad trip. Um, you know, a, a bad trip might be, um, 
hallucinations or uncontrollable paranoia or uh, reckless behavior. Um, why ultimately do people have bad trips? You know, I think that there's really no bad trips. There's um, bad experiences that you didn't integrate properly, right? I, I really hope that everyone has a lesson from these things. Of course, there can be unsafe experiences, right? If, for example, if you're on a medication that maybe is not safe for you to take psychedelics with, and then you have a really, really bad, you know, experience, right, with racing heart and paranoia and things like that, that's a whole nother class of bad experiences and bad trips. But if you're having an uncomfortable experience because say um, unresolved trauma is coming up, right? Sometimes that's actually the purpose of taking psychedelics, right? Uh, you want to actually work through some traumas. It's not all unicorns and rainbows. Okay, I'm gonna see, you know, melting, you know, walls and hallucinations and things like that. It's gonna be beautiful, amazing. I'm gonna write in my journal afterwards and everything and it's gonna just be enlightenment and I'm Buddha. Like, that's not how that works. Sometimes you have to go through some things um, and it's uncomfortable. Um, and a lot of people sometimes aren't expecting that. They're not sure what to do with that. And so, again, it's all about set and setting. Part of this is, you know, knowing, you know, what the proper dose is, knowing how to take psychedelics if you're unfamiliar with it or you're taking a dose that's larger or you're, you are going through something, you know, to have somebody, you know, sit with you and make sure you're okay and to take care of you and things like that so that you can go through a better experience. Um, it's always important if you do have a weird or again, bad trip, right? To know what was different about that experience, especially if you're a more experienced person, right? Did you take something else with that? You know, what was what was going on that was a little bit different. And usually you can pinpoint something was off, you know, or maybe again, that was, there was a lesson for you to learn and you need to integrate that afterwards. Usually there's something that you can pinpoint. Um, and then of course, there's always, you know, the possibility that maybe the substance that you were using was uh, adulterated in some way as well. We have to remember that psychedelics, of course, are not pure pharmaceuticals and things like that. So there's a lot of things that can play into, you know, a, a bad trip. Um, Shingo, I don't know if you want to contribute. Sure. Um, uh, I agree with everything Dr. Ross said, but I will uh, 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 break out uh, two parts, uh, the set and setting part, um, because a lot we often use this term set and setting. And I've realized from talking with patients that um, not everyone necessarily knows what that means. And set is your mindset. And so a lot of people, you know, they just think, oh, I'm going to do uh, psychedelics casually. And uh, except for uh, microdosing, that's like really not the case. You are taking a trip. And just like if you were to take a vacation, you would prepare and pack appropriately. And so you want to make sure you have a mindset where if if, if you are already in a crappy mood, um, psychedelics are usually just expand the mood that you are presently in. And so so you don't necessarily take mushrooms to make your mood better. You you try to get yourself in a, you know, as, as good of a headspace as you can be, because like I know some people are dealing with trauma, so they're not necessarily going to be happy, but, but be in the best you know one of the better mood states that you can be and then take the psychedelics because that mindset will really set the tone for your experience and then you're setting the location and who you're going to be with uh, um, you know is very as uh, important as well you if you're if you're kind of like an outdoor nature person don't be taking your psychedelics and then uh, being inside with a room full of people with a loud television and and everybody else is drinking right you're, mm -hmm. you're setting yourself up for for these bad experiences. And so um, first making sure your head's in the right place and then making sure you've kind of planned out your trip. You make sure that you you know where you're going to be. You're going to make sure you've got your favorite snacks. Make sure you've got a lot of water and, and then open yourself to the experience. One other thing I want to point out is, um, uh, you know, uh, mushrooms have been done without uh, therapeutic or counselor care for forever. But, you know, if you're somebody who uh, suffers from from uh, serious depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, things of this nature, you know, I would definitely consider at the very least discussing your 
mindset with your uh, care provider first and perhaps have um, such a person present for it. Because um, if you already have a questionable relationship with consensus reality, um, a, you know, a, a proper dose could cause um, that, that fissure to become even greater. And um, I would also add to that everyone before they go on a psychedelic trip should have uh, the fireside uh, hotline like on their their phone. So there's a free uh, number that you can call um, and you wouldn't remember to call them if you didn't already have it on your phone. So like do that, put that number in before you go on your trip. And in case you have something come up and you're panning and gigging, you're by yourself or you just need to talk to somebody they have people that you can talk to or text. Most of the time, um, I don't think it's 24 seven yet. Hopefully with funding, they will be, but um, it's a wonderful nonprofit service. And it's just amazing to be able to contact someone. Um, you know, hopefully uh, with the psychedelic renaissance, those services will just keep on expanding. But to have a trained person that is there without judgment to help you integrate that process or to be able to just tell you, like, you're not going to die. Like, whatever you're going through is okay. I've gone through it too. It is okay. You are alive. You are not dying it is okay. Like, that's all sometimes you need if you're, you're going through a really bad trip. But if you're going through a bad trip and you're by yourself, it is scary. So, Free hotlines exist to help you. So put those in your phone before you go on a trip. We talk a lot about in the cannabis industry, if you're going to eat uh, an edible, uh, wait, wait a while. The, the worst thing is, is to overconsume and then have the heart palpitations and the, the thoughts of panic and, um, you know, you're, you're going to die or <laughs> whatever. Um, what is a the moderate dose? Because I was looking online doing some research for for this panel, and I saw that they put a moderate dose of like between one and three and a half grams. But when I did three and a half grams, like that was a huge dose. I got into an argument with a poster. I don't know if you guys remember Red Dog, uh, a beer poster, but my my college roommate had a, a poster, and I got into an argument with the dog in the poster. <laughs> from three and a half grams. And they're trying to tell me that's a moderate dose. I don't think that's a party dose. Uh, can you guys like explain what a moderate dose should be? Sure. The, the, so there's a, there's a pretty common scale. And if people really want to go in depth into this, they can check out the a recent episode of Shaping Fire where I interview Dr. Miyabi Shields, and we talk about um, the, um, uh, the the how the chemical brain functioning impacts uh, when you do a, a heroic dose all the way down to a microdose. So generally, it is a microdose is going to be 0.1 of a gram. A mu museum dose or something that you might enjoy um, an activity um, around other people uh, would I would consider a moderate dose would be one gram. And then from one gram up to three and a half grams, really more like your two to three and a half grams um, would be what what we would consider a, a you know taking a trip, right? Do, doing my mushrooms. But then there is over three and a half, which people will either call a heroic dose or a um, you know an ego death dose. You know, uh, you know a, a, anything after three grams is getting very serious, right? You'll be you're going to be high, you're going to be high for a while, and and uh, your uh, relationship with consensus reality will will definitely shift. And so, um, you know, uh, know that you know it, it, as soon as you get above two, you're you know th things are things are getting uh, more than moderate. <laughs> I would like to add, though, that everyone's experience is a little bit different due to their yeah. brain chemistry, and we have to realize that most Americans are on some kind of medication. Now for women, they're on birth control. Um, now many people are on mental health medications and people are looking for you know, magic mushrooms to help with their depression or anxiety. So a lot of people are already on antidepressants, right? And they're not gonna just quit their antidepressants cold turkey. Of course, that's not safe to begin with, but they're not really tapering down their their dose to go on say a recreational dose of mushrooms for one day right and so a lot of antidepressants actually blunt your response to psilocybin mushrooms so some of the dose ranges that you're talking about somebody who's already on psilocybin mushrooms some people might have a slightly you know um 
more sensitive response to mushrooms, but most people will have a blunted response. So they might have to take slightly more mushrooms to have the same response. So it's interesting. There, there is a slight deviation in range. And again, um, it's, it's, it really depends on how your brain chemistry is, what your medications are on, your weight, et cetera, what, whether you're drinking alcohol or not, you know, uh, how much sleep you've gotten, what other supplements you're on. There's some supplements that you can take that are, uh, will either boost the serotonin in your system or not, like 5-HTP, et cetera. So there's all sorts of little things, that, little variables that can affect how your experience uh, of uh, psilocybin mushrooms go. Yeah, you mentioned alcohol and, and Shango <clears throat> mentioned alcohol uh, at, at the beginning. Um, and, and Shango, you you live down the street from your buddy, um, Dr. Ethan Russo. And yes, he, yeah, he, he coined uh, entourage effect. So I'm curious about the entourage effect in, in magic mushrooms. That, that's So the entourage effect suggests that there's the sum of contributing parts of a botanical or biological process that produces a greater synergistic effect um, in comparison to the effects of each individual part when mm -hmm. presented alone, does the entourage effect hold true for, for mushrooms? Well, uh, the first answer is we don't really know yet because the research has not been allowed for so long. We are still learning what all the components and metabolites that are present in mushrooms that might be active. Now, last week on Shaping Fire, we um, interviewed a, uh, a a mushroom analytics lab operator, and he went he spoke at length about the different analytes other than psilocybin that may be playing a role in our experiences, but we can continually ran up against walls of science that does not exist yet. For example, those of us who are all familiar with cannabis and cannabis dosing knows that um, the terpene profile is exceptionally important, especially for uh, consumers that are only looking at THC, right? Terpenes play a huge role in sculpting the variety of the, 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 the experience. Well, mushrooms have terpenes as well, and we're only now starting to begin to look into those terpenes, what they might be and what their effects might be might be and what the secondary metabolites in uh, psilocybin mushrooms that could be influencing things. Mostly we focus on psilocybin because it converts to psilocin in the body and that's actually the hallucinogen. So um, I would say that um, uh, we do not have firm evidence of an entourage effect like we do for cannabinoids in mushrooms yet, but that research is going on and um, uh, you know, many folks expect that we're going to start finding secondary metabolites that are not psilocybin, which are adding to either the, 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 you know, this is the central nervous system healing experience or just the, like the psychedelic experience itself. I mean, the fact that you have synthetic uh, psilocybin, right. And it has a different uh, effect than a, say a full spectrum, you know, mushroom, I is evidence that there probably is an entourage effect. Then you also have the fact that there's, you know, multiple hundred, if not hundreds of psilocybin, you know, species out there, right? And they all have different, you know, they do have different amounts of psilocybin in them, but they also have different amounts of these other, you know, like uh, baocysteine and, and, and other uh, compounds in them. So they do have different effects uh, from how long, you know, the high is, how intense the high is, et cetera, right? So for example, if you go to Amsterdam, there's all different types of mushrooms you can take and they can sort of quantify what kind of effect you're going to have if you can go and take them, right? So we sort of can tell, hey, there are differences in mushrooms if you take them. So I do think that there is an entourage effect. Yes, we do need to, to quantify that, that similar to how we, we have in cannabis, but there, there's definitely something going on. Shango, you mentioned uh, earlier on that... Um psilocybin rewires the brain. And, and you also mentioned that there's no studies that have been, uh, that have evaluated the long-term effects of repeated use of, of magic mushrooms. And so I kind of want to bring that question back up about long-term effects of magic mushrooms. They've been used in therapeutic settings to treat a variety of ailments and disorders, including cluster headaches, obsessive compulsive disorders, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, and a recent resurgence in the research into the therapeutic effects showing promising results. But what's it going to take to enter mainstream psychiatry? Well, legality, that's for sure. Um, and, and you know, in the municipalities where mushrooms are uh, have been blessed, you know, Portland, Berkeley, 
Colorado, um, you know, you're starting to see um, programs exist where there are now uh, certified and licensed, well, not probably not licensed yet, but at least certified and trained facilitators um, who are working with patients. Um, but as far as the long term impacts, I, I would say two things. Um, number one, I mean, it, it is a natural medicine that people take for uh, longish periods. And, and historically, anecdotally, we don't see problems. But the very nature of mushrooms is, is not really designed for long-term use, right? The idea is that um, uh, you want to cycle onto the mushrooms, take them from a, for a particular period of time, and then take a break and see how you're doing. Because um, unlike, let's say that if you are a pain patient and you're, you're using cannabis because you don't want to use an opioid, right? Um, you can often, if, if, if you're a chronic patient and you're going to be in pain the rest of your life, you'll probably be using cannabis the rest of your life. And we understand that, but that's not really how it is with mushrooms. If you are depressed and you are going to uh, microdose and also uh, you know, do your therapy and make some life changes. And then in, in three months after you're done with a, you know, a three month protocol, um, you know, it's usually recommended that you get off it for a while and see how you're doing. And, and uh, similarly, you know, you're also not going to be taking, you know, large doses every day. Um, uh, not, not only will that, get exhausting but um you know that's that's not the, the the mode of use for for this medicine and so um i would say that um while those studies for long-term use are still um being done it is also not the nature of the drug and dr ross do you have anything you want to add to that i mean when you compare mushrooms to typical antidepressants right um, I would say that psychiatrists and therapists are looking for things like safety, right? And one of the biggest safety concerns they have is um, the issues that patients have withdrawing off of antidepressants. In fact, a, a lot of patients don't see any efficacy after being on uh, antidepressants for years, but they have such issues uh, in, in side effects trying to withdraw from these antidepressants that they're stuck on them. They can't taper off of them. They're, they're literally just taking in them because it is so horrific to uh, get off of, of these antidepressants. So for uh, a therapist or a psychiatrist, even if a patient had to be on mushrooms long-term, <laughs> um, you know, if, if there were no side effects to that, that would be less risky um, than having them be on pharmaceuticals. Now, the fact that they could be on them and be able to get off them with no side effects and no harms and then be able to go back on them without any real issues is actually very, very safe and, and, and very, very beneficial. So I think it's, again, like the, the risk and benefit and analysis for any therapist is it's really going to be a very, very exciting thing once this is all legalized. Um, again, you know, I don't think that we're going to have the natural forms of uh, uh, some of these substances uh, in the offices, we're going to see synthetics, unfortunately, um, because pharmaceuticals are what we see. Um, they might not be as safe as uh, what we're saying, um, you know, with the substances that are being microdosed, um, but they're probably going to be a, a safer form um, than what, uh, you know, the antidepressants and other medications that people are currently using. So again, safer is, is better. And that's really what all it comes down to for doctors. I feel like we could carry this conversation longer, but y'all got a vacation to go to or whatever. It's sunny in Seattle, Shango. You got something to do, I know. So we're going to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guest, Shango Loss. He is with uh, the founder and host of Shaping Fire. You can find Shaping Fire on uh, YouTube and probably a bunch of other places. At anywhere you download your podcast. That's it. And then Dr. Michelle Ross, she's the founder of Infuse Health. Is it uh, Infuse Health? Uh... It's drmichelleross.com. Bam, there you go. All right. So with that, we're going to roll this one up. We're going to be back uh, and, and just after the commercial break with another panel. So I want to thank both Sh Shango and Dr. Ross. Appreciate you guys being with us. Have a great weekend. Thank Thanks, you. Josh. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out. And check out these other videos that we've got.